Hi, everybody. It's John Jay. Today is April the 24th, and this is a part two of what I began speaking about uh, regarding the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, as they call it. And uh, one of you had asked me what I thought of the new rule or regulation. I hadn't heard of it. I did some research on it. And so I'm going to continue the conversation I began, uh, I think it was two days ago. It was on Saturday, yeah, two days ago. Um, so I did some more research and I'm gonna change a couple of things I said. I'm gonna recommend some things here and I'm gonna share with you, you can, you can have this letter. This is going to benefit everyone if you'll just use it. Don't be afraid. I'm gonna explain myself here, but let me just walk through this letter that I've done. I think this letter is probably the best way to summarize and explain what we're dealing with here, okay? So let me just give you an intro though. So the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, is administered through the Internal Revenue Service, okay? And if FinCEN needs to bring an action against somebody, like sue somebody or prosecute someone in a crime, it goes to the Department of Justice. FinCEN, I believe, is an agency or office also of the Department of Treasury. So, you know, it's complicated, but we have there's different oversight for FinCEN. And I'm gonna get into that and I'm gonna explain why that's important. But FinCEN is implementing certain laws and this goes all the way back to the, the Patriot Act, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act, the Bank Secrecy Act, the Anti-Money Laundering Act, and more recently, the um, Corporate Transparency Act in, of 2022, last year. I believe it was September. And so there's a section in there, 6403, that we're talking about. And the video I've done, I'm not gonna rehash the whole thing, but I explained the origin, the foundation, the basis of all this stuff. So what I'm gonna show you here is how I suggest you should interact with FinCEN. I think we have to do something here. I don't think there's a fix. I just think that we have to take action. It's gonna be very simple. Um, I've already prepared this. I think if you guys just wanna go with this, um, that's it's that simple. I mean, I spent many hours on this, putting this together. I did lots of research here to see if I can actually say these things. Okay, I just made this. I didn't just make this up. It's really important. Um, and I think if enough of us send this letter off, and we are past the comment period, we're past the public comment debate, public comment period, because these this rule is already in the Federal Register and now it's already adopted. It's it's not going to become implemented until January of this coming year, 2024. So what's interesting is I think what you're going to see here in my explanation and how I'm doing this is enough to, I think they're gonna shut it down or delay it, all right? Now, I have a collection of, I call this a complaint, an administrative complaint. It's not really in the proper form. I called that way for a reason. I wanted to try to exhaust administrative remedy as quickly as possible. And I'll explain what that what I mean by that. But what, you, what you're gonna see here is a list of questions they're really legal arguments and also some criticisms as to the foundation of what they're trying to do here. Um, and among other things, it's some editorial that I put in there. But basically, uh, and, and I do, you know me, I have a bit of a sense of humor, but I'm, this is a very serious matter. So even though sometimes I come off as a smart ass, uh, there's, a, there's a message here, okay? So let me just uh, flip over there and do a screen, a screen share. And I'm going to walk through it here. All right. So what you're looking at is my a proposed written correspondence that I'm proposing that you send with the intent of getting a response. Now, I have written it, and I'll show you down below. I have written in a way that if you want to, you can send it anonymously. My hope is that many, many people send it anonymously. I hope that many everyone who sends it and wants a response, that you also send it anonymously. Many of them, right? And so let's just walk through these this, the components here. So the secured party, and we are going to use that security agreement to just bash him in the head. But before we even get there, I want to share with you the legal aspects of this. So behind this letter, you're going to back it up with a security agreement. But just with this letter, <clears throat> you're going to list yourself and maybe it's John Smith, right? Maybe you want to use an alias. Maybe you want to use your real legal name. It doesn't matter. Um, you can put your address here. So that kind of matters. If you want a response, you definitely want to give them the correct address. Okay. You don't need to give them your email address, although you can. 
Um, and of course, it's it's versus the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. But actually, there's there's some other parties involved, but I'm just going to call it FinCEN we're dealing with, okay? So here's my distribution list, and I always have the habit of putting it at the top of my, my correspondences. You guys can do it however you want. That's my style here. So definitely, it's going to go to the uh, chief counsel, okay, the top attorney at FinCEN, okay, Katrina Carroll. It's also going to go to the Speaker of the House of Representatives because that has to do with oversight. It's also going to the U.S. Attorney General because that's a chief counsel for the United States. FinCEN is the United States. And then we have the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and there is some role of uh, this agency. There is some role. I don't know what the exact role is, but I believe it is part of an oversight role. Um, it's not that important that we know that right yet. We'll, we'll, we'll find out when we get a response. I am going to do this and get a response. Um, there is an oversight committee for FinCEN, and it happens to be the House Financial Services Committee, okay? Oversight of FinCEN, right? And here's the address and so forth. Then the Inspector General. Now, the Inspector General has his own role, okay? And, and we'll get into that. What I'm, uh, you know, we're going to put the date in there, <clears throat> the date that you send it, so you can see here it's blank. But uh, I'm referring to this section. This is all we're talking about, Section 6403 of the uh, Corporate Transparency Act. Uh, and this happens to be uh, for the 2022 amendments. And then it's implemented under 31 CFR Part 1010, specifically point 230, where it talks about the collection of um, beneficial owner interest when it comes to, in our case, members of an LLC. It also applies to any other corporate trustee, trust structure, S Corp, C Corp, you name it, okay? Not sole proprietorships. It does not specifically apply to unregistered trusts. However, I did make the comment that it would. And the reason why I say that is because I think that the way FinCEN operates and the way I've seen it operate is I believe that if they catch hold of uh, your use of a trust that's not registered, they will attack it as um, trying to escape the law, all right? I'm just gonna share that with you. I could be wrong, but that's what I'm thinking. I've witnessed that many times. So what I, what I did here is I said, look, this is a complaint under the Administrative Procedures Act, okay, in Section 5, uh, 571 of Title V, okay, this explains that government agencies um, are subject to administrative hearings uh, by those with, you know, an adverse or a complaint or adverse situation, right? You have to go through this in order to get permission to sue the United States. Now, I'm not saying we need to do this. I don't, I'm not saying we need to sue. I think, though, we need to make the case that the United States could be sued. So to get that waiver, part of the way to get the waiver is that you have to request an administrative hearing. And I also, it just as it turns out, I'm asking for supplemental instruction, a copy of the rules of procedure, okay? Um, anyways, there you go. Now, I'm going to make these two logical arguments that, in my opinion, destroys the entire regulation, destroys the entire ability of the United States to impose this regulation on anybody forming an LLC, first of all. If the regulation is imposed upon prospective companies, okay, you have it in mind that you're going to set up an LLC. It hasn't been set up yet. It's not recognized as a company yet. Therefore, it does not yet have a legal duty according to the regulation. So um, if, if the regulation prevents the formation of such a company, how can the regulation be imposed upon the company before it is not yet recognized as a company? So what good is a regulation if it doesn't apply until the company's formed? Leads me to my next question. If the United States does not have a system in place to prevent the formation of the company, and therefore the company is then ultimately registered and recognized, then the United States is acting as an accomplice in the violation of its own regulation. When the company refuses to report, and this is what I want to get into, the company or its organizer refuses to report or the individuals that own the company, that own the company, that have the beneficial interest, re refuse to report or refuse to report, let's call it accurate information, okay? Let's say they only want to use aliases or they don't want to use any information at all. So there's, there's a, a logical uh, conundrum, if you will, with either the first or second example here. I could stop talking right there. I could end the letter right there. And I think they'd have a big problem and that that would put the brakes on their whole thing. That's why I say, if, if we could just send this out, 
I think that right there is enough to shut this down and they have to rethink this monstrosity they're trying to create. So now I also want to include something uh, important. There's another important section of this letter. Now this letter is six pages long and I, I'm not saying, I mean, really, okay, send the six page letter, but, but more importantly, understand all the different aspects of this letter so that you can understand what's going on with your LLC. Okay. If you have one or a new one and yeah, it's, it's going to affect new L, uh, existing LLCs at some point. I'm not sure how it would affect those that don't have to file annual reports. I'm thinking it might. I said on my last call that I think that it would. So um, I want to point their attention to section D and you're going to like this section because this is where I just destroy them. Okay. The reporting company is the company being registered by an organizer. So if you, if you get me to set up a company for you, I'm technically the organizer. I don't use my name as the organizer. It's just as well to use your name as the organizer. That way there's less names, right? I mean, it makes your job easier to go to the bank and open the account. That's why I've always done it that way. That's why I name my client as the registered agent. Again, perfectly legal. And that's what you're supposed to do. Make it streamlined for the client so he can just get on with the thing he wants to do. I don't need to make it a dramatic thing for you to set up a company. So the reporting company is, let's say in our case, the LLC and the responsible party is going to be the organizer. All right. So regarding this, this law here and the reg, Okay, et, sec, et sequitur means everything that follows. The U.S. cannot be trusted. So here's why I go into my editorial. So you guys might laugh at this. So I'm just saying, look, you guys got to be kidding me. You guys can't even be trusted. Look at look at the long history you've had of conducting illegal surveillance on your own people. Even your own public officials have been doing that to each other. I mean, come on. What, what are you doing, right? So the U.S. dollar is the most prominently used and pervasive means of money laundering. Why am I all of a sudden a suspect and you don't even have a crime to prosecute? Or investigate, and I'm, and I'm somehow a suspect, right? So, so I'm asking them, look at the look at the enormity that what they're talking about. First of all, the U.S., as you know, has been promising or telling that they need this and they need that in order to uh, prevent money laundering and prevent acts of terrorism. Well, have they done that? No. So, what is the difference now? Is is this whole editorial okay? If you guys don't like that, you can take it out. I'm just. I just think they should hear it. But please, I'm asking, please explain how collecting four or five points of data, well, they want your name, address, they want your ID, they want an image of your ID, they probably want your SSN, right? They want your legal name, okay? How is that going from taking it from small businesses that may, might make several thousand dollars a month, okay? How is that gonna enable the United States to accomplish all these noble sounded things when it hasn't even been able to do that so far with trillions of dollars, right? So then I'm making fun of them on the, the carbon tax and the fake uh, climate change and all this nonsense. I had to throw that in there. Then I made fun of them on the war on drugs and the war on terror. It's a complete failure, right? Had to say that. Um, then we get into this. Now, here's what they're doing. They're saying, our intent in collecting this information through the Secretary of State's office is to prevent acts of terrorism, money laundering, and other financial crimes, uh, including... Uh, uh, risks and threats to national security. Hmm, how noble sounding is that? But yet they don't have any pending criminal investigations. They're just saying, look, everybody's a suspect today. In case we ever have a criminal investigation, we will already have the suspect's information. Hmm, that sounds like an end run around the Constitution, doesn't it? So I call them hypothetical crimes. So prove that any of these hypothetical crimes still exist and you admit complete failure, right? So the, the thing is, these hypothetical crimes, terrorism and so forth, those still exist. That wasn't cured. So they failed. So what's different now? They're just, all they're doing is more of the same. Let's get more tax dollars. Let's impose more regulations on our population. That's still not going to help you. You've proven that. So we can't demonstrate that they've, they've been able to succeed or that there's any causal connection to their legislation and the, the problem they, they are claiming to be able to solve. Right. So I'm really making fun of them here. OK, if you want to prevent money laundering, get rid of the bank, get rid of the Federal Reserve Bank, get rid of Wall Street, uh, then then we're going to be good. OK, don't get don't don't penalize me. Uh, but technically, so then I, you know, my dry sense of humor is, but technically speaking, uh, the stated purpose for the collection of my financial data is disingenuous because the claim to be calculated to prevent financial crimes of terrorism or threats to national security is based on the implausible fantasy that everyone is a, is a suspect in an unidentified or hypothetical financial crime just because he has an interest in a corporation. This is what I'm talking about here, okay? Now, of course, all these ideas of Fifth Amendment come up and Fourth Amendment, 
but I'm going to show you how I'm wording this. It's a little bit different than everybody else likes to do it. It's also based on the implausible and ridiculous scenario that everyone has waived his rights to due process, protection against unreasonable searches and seizures, privacy, the right to rely upon and enjoy the protections of the law. When do you ever hear that? That's a property right. You have a ex reasonable expectation to that right. The right to justice, the right to refuse to be a witness against himself or his own interests, freedom of association and other rights. All right. So this is how I worded it. I didn't cite the Constitution. I just said, look, I have property rights and these your regulation violates my property rights. Which leads us into the, the security lien, all right, the security agreement. So therefore, while your regulation is a lien upon my private property rights, it is. We can counteract that with a security agreement. It is also the collection and storage, use and distribution of my financial information. So along with it's my personal financial tax credit, biographic, biometric identifying information, all that stuff, right? So let's do this. Let's talk about from the beginning, when you collect my information in this manner, I'm going to say, I'm going to argue that this constitutes a waiver of your immunity. So I call this section A and let's explain. Please be advised that the practice of conducting a criminal investigation where there is no crime and no warrant for the collection of evidence constitutes a waiver of sovereign immunity. Now, I didn't do any legal research to find out if that's true. I think it is true. I think I can back it up, but time will tell. I don't really care. I'm just making a statement, okay? At least for the reason that this conduct exceeds your legal duties and authority, exceeds the purview of your office. Now, that's true. If you act, act outside of your office, you're not immune. OK, uh, furthermore, these practices exceed the authorized use of public funds for the reason that the United States never obtained budget approval to investigate any crime before the discovery of any evidence that a crime had taken place. Makes sense. No law permits a government agency, even one with a police power, such as FinCEN, because it does have a police power. So does the IRS to investigate a crime and collect evidence against anyone solely upon the possibility that the person may someday be a suspect in a crime, it's at least unreasonable, unre if not illegal. So moreover, the collection of information under the guise of the claim of, the false claim of, investigating a crime or hypothetical fantasy where no crime has been committed and then using this information for commercial purposes, which you'll find out soon enough, that's what they're doing with it, such as distributing or disclosing the information to private parties, such as the financial institutions for their own business purposes, this is actually part of the discussion of what they're doing with this information. Also constitutes a waiver of sovereign immunity. This is this is my argument. I'm, I don't I can't back it up yet, but it's okay. Your refusal or failure to answer these questions in good faith constitutes an exhaustion of all administrative remedies under Title Five, Five Seventy One of the admin, you know, the APA, and therefore a waiver of sovereign immunity. So furthermore, this conduct and these practices may also constitute the abuse, fraud, and waste of public funds and that brings in your attorney general's or your um, inspector general's office okay that's why i copy the ig's office on this one line here all right i mean we can make a case if we wanted to now if you are going to collect this information or if i decide to give it to you i i want to be immune i have immunity from civil or criminal prosecution if i'm going to give you give up information that could be used as evidence against myself later, even though there's no pending criminal investigation. There's a hypothetical one, possibly. So I just basically tell them that that's the quid pro quo. That's what you get. That's the exchange. I get immunity, transactional immunity. That means the whole thing. I am immune from everything, not just my testimony, right? Anything related to your investigation. Even if I'm committing the crime of money laundering, if I give you up, give up the information first, because the regulation says I have to, then I'm going to say that I want transactional immunity, even if I'm involved with a crime later on, et cetera. So that's the idea behind section B, all right? So in section C, I'm going to tell them flat out, and again, you guys may not like this, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell them, I deliberately intend to exercise my rights to have privacy, and I'm going to do whatever it takes 
to defeat your regulation. I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to create another structure and any means necessary, okay? You can see the colorful language I put in here, okay? I fully intend to use any and all means, including but not limited to cash, bartering, the dark web, precious metals, blah, 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 okay? Furthermore, to secure these rights, this is where we get into the security agreement. To secure these rights upon the collection of my information, if somehow you are able to affect this, you will be required to waive sovereign immunity and submit to the terms of a perfected security interest. Now, I took the security agreement that I was working on, which is pretty well done, by the way, if any of y'all want to do it. And I revised it slightly for this purpose because I want to describe a different set of rights, which I didn't include in the first one. This is a little bit different. And I did uh, make some uh, important modifications, including this thing about immunity. All right. Um, and I'm including binding arbitration. And I, I could talk about that, but they're going to be required that, to waive their rights to a jury trial in a court of law. So this security agreement is going to really kick them in the balls. Right. But this letter is going to make them sit up and take notice and they might just discontinue the program uh, even before we get into into uh, next year. Now, the reporting company, as I mentioned before, Section D, the reporting company, that's the company that you want to form or that you're using your company, your LLC or whatever. Regarding the legal duties of, re of the reporting company, now, here's how they have it working. So the reporting company is supposed to collect information from the uh, member. So let's say you you hire me to uh, set up a company and let's say John Jay is going to be the organizer and he's forming the reporting company. And as the organizer, he's legally responsible according to this reg. You don't have to read it. I'll tell you. You can read it if you want, but I'm just telling you what the reg says. The organizer is legally responsible for collecting the information from the member. So if you're my client and you have me do this and you're the 100% owner, let's say, I'm legally required to collect your true legal name and maybe you don't want to give me your legal name because you don't have to deal with the banks. You just want a company to own title to real estate for your mom's estate, right? Well, you can lie to me and, and give me a fictitious name. I don't care. It's all legal to do that. It's legal to use an alias. They're just not going to let you do that. And they're not going to let me let you do that as the organizer or so that, or so they think. Okay. So as the organizer, if you give me whatever information that the regulation says you have to give me, I have to certify its accuracy and correctness. And if, and if I don't, it's supposed to be a crime in which I'm liable, okay? But what happens if I certify it and you lied to me or you gave me false information or a fake document or something like that, and if I've certified the accuracy and correctness, then I'm still liable, criminally liable. How's that fair? And how's that fair if I don't have the police power to investigate what you're telling me? Vincent has a police power, but Vincent is telling me that I have to do that for the reporting company where I'm the organizer for the owner of the company, okay, the, the the member, the managing member, the member, you, okay, my client in this case. How's that legally enforceable? How do I have control over whether or not you tell me the truth? And if I have no resources, I don't have any police power. I can't require that you give me correct, accurate information. And if I did, it would cost me money. I'd have to subscribe. I have to file a fire. Um, I'd have to hire a private investigator, possibly subscribe to, you know, websites that have this database information. You see what I'm getting into? So they're creating this duty on the person who organizes the company that's not legally enforceable. So this is what I explain here. Well, what I'm explaining here is it's creating the situation where people are just going to go and avoid uh, the Secretary of State. You can form a company by publishing the articles in the newspaper. They know this. You can actually form a company by not publishing the article. So there's all kinds of ways of doing it. I just went in here and just kind of rub their nose into what I'm going to do, right? How I'm going to resist. So that's just my thinking. And maybe some of you are thinking, well, John, why should we tell them ahead of time? You know, ah, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But anyways, so back to this reporting company must certify that the report is true, correct, and complete. Please answer the following. So this actually is quoted from the Privacy Act of 1995. I believe this is where they're getting this from the certification requirement under the FinCEN rule. I believe that's where it's coming from. I didn't quote it here because I'm not sure. I kind of don't care. It's good enough, all right? So here's my real question, important question. If the regulation requires a reporting company, its organizer, to report this information, what legal duty does it have to compel the company or myself, its organizer, or its owners to disclose this information for its duty to report? I don't have a duty to get the information from the members, the owners, the investors. I can only ask for it. I can't make them give it to me. 
I don't, I'm not a police. I don't have the police power. I don't have the facility. I don't have the training. I don't have the resources to do that. It's not my job, really. I'm not required to assist the government in a criminal investigation when there's not even a crime going on, you see? You see how, what kind of problem they're gonna run into here? So what happens if the individual, that would be you, okay? The individual ma managing member or member, my client. What happens if the individual refuses to give me the information? Well, I don't have to turn them away. Some people will, I won't. <laughs> Who's liable if he refuses? What authority or duty does the reporting company have and which regulation specifies these conditions, which there, it's in there, it's in there. But what I'm saying is, I don't think there's gonna be legally enforceable. I don't think they're even logically enforceable. Realistically, I think they're unrealistic at least. Then how can a reporting company be held liable for reporting data for which it may have no control or custody? See, this is the punchline. This is why we're gonna beat them over the head. They can't, I don't think they can push this through. I think maybe they'll wait to the last minute and then pull it or they'll extend the program, right? Or they'll delay it, right? I think that's what they'll do. But I bolded these more important questions. What if the individual provides the reporting company, the individual meaning yourself, you give me no information or false information? What is the, what, I mean, who has what liability there? What is, how is that my fault, right? What's the reporting company's legal duty or authority to investigate and authenticate the information provided before making this report to FinCEN? I have to make the report according to what the reg says. How is the reporting company required to be to, or able to certify the accuracy of the information when it has no police powers to conduct the investigation, when it receives no compensation or training for this? It's another unfunded mandate like the collection of sales tax and wage withholding. We never think about that, do we? You're collecting taxes for the government as a tax collector, but you're not a tax collector. And that power is not able to be delegated. Ooh, interesting. And then no police powers to access any official database to verify that the information is accurate. How am I supposed to do, how am I supposed to pull that off? Reasonably, how does the United States intend to indemnify the reporting company for acting as an agent of the U United States in the collection of financial and beneficial owner information, which requires the exercise of a police power that cannot and has not been delegated to the private company? It also creates a burden of having a data retention policy on there and also creates the risk of suffering a data breach while I'm doing my job, right? So I'm collecting this information and what if I suffer a data breach or what if I'm required to keep the information for a period of time? Who's gonna insure me against a data breach? Why do I have to get insurance to collect the government's information for a future possible criminal investigation? It's crazy, right? So how does FinCEN expect to impose this duty on a private party when FinCEN currently has no means or mechanism in place to verify the authenticity or accuracy of the information for itself. What? The regulation says I have to certify the correctness of the information, but right now, as of today, April 24th, FinCEN does not have the means to do the same that it's requiring of its reporting companies and organizers. Hmm, interesting. So, and I guess I maybe I'm a little bit redundant here, but what is your authority for collecting my financial and beneficial ownership information from a private party in order to prevent the commission of a hypothetical crime? Even though there was no evidence of any crime involving myself or my financial interest, and even though the private party, the reporting company or its organizer has no police powers, there is no such authority. In section E, so I, I broke these into sections. So here's where we get into the data retention stuff, right? Actually, it's the data retention. Well, there's the data retention aspect of it, but then there's also, as part of that, there has to be a procedure where, whereby the, the custodian of the records can destroy the data or, or return original documents to whomever originally provided them, the owner. Mostly um, data that's collected in this way is destroyed and it's done with a certification process. It's very important. This is an international standard. I'm gonna show you what it looks like. By the way, this is part of the security agreement. When you guys see it, a lot of this, a lot of these provisions are already in the security agreement. So, regarding the collection of my financial or beneficial information in a corporation, um, what is your purpose, right? So we always ask them to start. Off, what's your purpose? Um, if you if you intend to prevent all these crimes, I'm not aware of any pending criminal investigations for any such crimes, and where I'm a suspect. Please inform me if I'm a suspect in any criminal investigation related to my financial interest in a corporation. Yeah, they're really going to answer that. How will my financial and beneficial inf information be stored? Okay, this is your more generic 
questions you, that you would ask your, your chiropractor or these idiots, okay? Who will have access under what terms? So there's got to be somebody who's accountable for those records. You can't just have it available in the lobby of some office location and everybody that walks in can see your private information, right? It has to be available for the intended purpose and it has to be secured and there has to be a custodian assigned. So someone's responsible for that data. Now it could be a group of people that's responsible, but still it has to be a custodian, a specific person or a group of people, okay? Provide me the name, employment, title, and physical address of the custodian. We're entitled to know that. Where's it gonna be stored, right? Once you obtain my information, how do you intend to verify its accuracy? They don't know yet. That's why I asked them. If my data is stored electronically, I need to know the identity of the, of the address and all, all that, how to get access to it. What's the cybersecurity training? So I get into, uh, how are you guys trained for this? How, are you get, how do I know that uh, you're, you're uh, holding my records and information in a way that you have the actual training to understand how to do that correctly, right? Do you know how to use your software? What happens if your people get fired? Can any of your employees, what happens in a situation where one of the employees or his family is held ransom until he breaches the security? What kind of training is there? I don't even know what that is. But these are questions that we have a right to ask. What is your financial responsibility? So, so how much money would you have to pay me? How, what is your insurance limit? Because my data is expensive or my data is valuable. And maybe it's a blank check. Maybe we don't know how valuable it is. Well, how are you covered for this? By the way, I don't think you can get coverage for an infinite risk. <laughs> So please provide a copy of your insurance binder. So I want to see evidence of your financial responsibility. That's an insurance binder or a certification or some document saying for this specific thing, data breach regarding such and such and such, here's the limit of our liability, just like your car insurance. Okay, same idea. And you can see this goes on and on and on. So I'm just going to go through this real quick. So we want a copy of your whole policy. All right. Um, I want to know what technology you're using. Um, what what do you believe you're relying upon that constitutes a waiver of my rights? And again, this is all explained here, right? How did I waive any rights here? Did I? Please describe the reasonable basis for you to collect my financial and beneficial ownership information for a hypothetical crime. Again, this is kind of redundant, but still, I'm going to, you know, keep on bringing this up. Describe the rationale or reasonable basis for you to collect my, my information for a hypothetical crime and from a private party having no police authority. I mean, imagine if the cops were, um, okay, so imagine if the cops, this is stupid hypothetical, but imagine if you were suspected of shoplifting, right? So the cops show up on the scene and they tell the store manager, okay, so I'm the I'm the police officer responding to your call from for a shoplifter. And so because you're the store manager, I'm going to tell you to go over to the shoplifter and I want you to arrest him. That's not going to work. That's actually illegal, okay? Because the cop's there. He's supposed to do it. Describe the rationale to collect data. Having Okay, P provide a list of individuals who have, been pay who have been and will be given access to my data and the terms and disclosures uh, and access. Again, it's kind of redundant, but how do you expect financial institutions to benefit from your uh, the, your collection, use, and storage of my beneficial ownership interest in a legal entity. And they do. There's a commercial uh, benefit to uh, the financial institutions, to your banks, to collect this and use it. Now, if they get it from the government, it's different, uh, maybe, than they if they get it from you when you open the account. Now, by the way, you've been giving this information. This is why at first I said it's okay to disclose it. Now I'm saying refuse. Um, you've been giving the same information already to the banks. What I come to understand here by reading all this is that FinCEN didn't have the authority to go to the banks and get it. What they're trying to do is say, ah, oh, you know, why do that when we could just go right to the Secretary of State's office? Hmm, I think that's a big mistake. It would have been much easier to get it through the banks quietly. Now, we, like I said, we're going to bash them over the head with this. Explain the manner or certification process by which my data will be discarded, disposed, or destroyed, including the time period from disclosure. Does your data, now here I go into, does your data destruction policy comply with international standards? You guys can read that for yourself. Please be advised that upon collection of my financial information, you will become the debtor in a security agreement with a perfected security interest in such data. You may also be liable to third parties with whom you expect to share my information, other banks or whoever. Do you have authority or budget approval for these practices and obligations in order to respond? Now, this is where if you want to do this passively and not get a response, but you just want to ping them, so to speak, and make them wake up, I would finish the letter here with this last line. Hey, if you respond, just publish your response in the Federal Register. 
However, if you add this in here, this is when you intend for them to respond back so that you get a letter back from somebody or several organizations, so several of these recipients, okay? And I know seven days is kind of ridiculous. You guys can make it whatever you want. I mean, they can ask for more time if they want, but I would leave it like that. And no, you don't have to sign it. Um, all you really need is to the, uh, provide them with a means by which the, they can send you a letter back, right? You can even include a stamp address, stamp, uh, a stamp, a stamped address uh, envelope if you want, self-addressed envelope. Um, but the, anyway, so this is this is what I'm suggesting. So, so if you want to know my full take on this so far, my, my, my way to deal with this is to refuse, 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 and make them take action against you. Now, some of you might be afraid to do that. I don't see the need to be afraid. Um, I think it's necessary. Otherwise, I wouldn't say so. But uh, I've done a lot of research on this. I'm going to do more research on this. But I think this is the way to go right here. And I think if we do this, enough of us send letters like this and send it to all your friends. That's why I'm giving you this. I'm going to put this in the Telegram uh, room on the Ace of Coins. You're welcome to use it. I'm going to put the uh, the LibreOffice version so you can edit this. And uh, you can. Uh, I'll put the PDF also if you just want to send it around. And also, I'll put the link to this video that explains what I'm doing here. I hope that I've covered everything. And certainly, um, we can have a discussion on this because I know there's going to be questions that I'm not addressing right now. So let me just stop that here. So good. This will be a good place for uh, ending the recording. Thanks for uh, hanging in there and listening to me read off a letter. But uh, this is my response if you're asking me about what to do on the new regs and the LLC formations. All right.